Hi, I'm Joe Burgo. I'm a clinical psychologist and I hate talking into this camera. I'm going to try hard to pretend I'm there in the room with you and that you're listening attentively and smiling. You're welcome. Maybe that way, even though I am going to be reading, I won't sound too wooden. So anyway, like I said, I'm a clinical psychologist and I also trained as a psychoanalyst, primarily within the object relations school of thought. Melanie Klein, Donald Winnicott, Donald Meltzer, these are some of the names who dominated the curriculum at my institute. For me in particular, I was influenced by Wilfred Bion, and much of what I have to say is informed by his theories. Now, I know that many of you, and maybe even most of you, consider psychoanalysis an outdated, outmoded form of treatment, and even I've departed dramatically from the way I was trained. All the same, I believe that a lot of what psychoanalysts have observed and written about in the last hundred years is still relevant, and relevant in particular to an understanding of unconscious process in ADHD. I don't mean all cases. I'm not offering a new theory about ADHD that applies across the board, but I would like to share my experience in working with a number of people who fit the profile and whose distractibility poor impulse control, and difficulty in focusing attention had roots in unconscious pain. In the psych literature these days, it seems that talking about the unconscious has gone out of favor. The predominant treatment approaches are, of course, pharmacological and cognitive behavioral, while the idea of searching for the unconscious roots of symptoms seems almost quaint. At the same time, the notion, of, the notion of an unconscious mind has entered the cultural mainstream and become a part of our belief system. At least as far back as Shakespeare, students of human nature have been observing that some people know themselves better than others. I take this up in the opening chapter of my first book, which is headed by an epigraph from King Lear. It's Act 1, Scene 1, a description of Lear. <clears throat> he hath ever but slenderly known himself. I also use a quote from Pride and Prejudice, one that appears after Elizabeth finally accepts the truth contained in Darcy's letter and recognizes that her own prejudice has blinded her. Till this moment, I never knew myself. Since Freud began writing about it more than a century ago, the psychoanalytic view that there are aspects of ourself of which we're not conscious has gone mainstream. Take, for one example, the so-called Freudian slip. Most of us have examples from our personal lives, and Freudian slips are a staple of Hollywood movies from Annie Hall to Liar Liar. Psychological defense mechanisms are what keep us from knowing parts of ourselves, of course, and even if psychologists don't write so much about them these days, a collective belief in the existence of defenses has also entered the mainstream. We often talk about a person behaving in a defensive way, or we refer to someone as repressed. Have you ever described a person as in denial, or have you told someone to stop projecting? These all reflect psychoanalytic concepts that have been absorbed into the cultural mainstream. We're saddled with a lot of bad English translations of Freud's work, and defense mechanisms is one of them mechanisms. Just, it just sounds so non-human. A better translation of Abwehr, Freud's word in German, would be warding off or fending off. One Kleinian analyst has defined psychological defense mechanisms as lies we tell ourselves to evade pain. So in other words, we fend off or ward off truths we find too painful to bear excluding them from conscious awareness and isolating them in the unconscious. So in recent years, I've also come to think of a defense mechanism as a shift of attention away from pain so that you don't have to notice it. Don't pay attention to that painful emotion. Focus on this other thought or feeling instead. Sometimes I think of defenses working the way a magician operates, by effectively distracting you from what you're not supposed to notice. We refer to the unnoticed thought or feeling as unconscious, 
but it's actually still there waiting to be noticed. By the way, Wilfred Bion's theories about truth and lying and psychotic attacks on the ability to pay attention have deeply influenced me here. Now, in my work with clients who might be described as overly cerebral, I usually educate them about where to look for their feelings. Although the process occurs automatically for most of us, the way we know what we feel is by observing sensations in specific areas of our bodies. I know I'm sad, for example, by sensations arising in my eyes, my throat, my chest. If you live in your head, so to speak, caught up in endless verbal thoughts, then you might never notice what you feel because you're not paying attention to your body. The feeling remains unconscious, unnoticed. Being able to divert your attention and distract yourself from pain is sometimes an adaptive response and a very useful skill to have in your toolbox. Here's one of my favorite examples from popular culture. In Gone with the Wind, Scarlett O'Hara says, I won't think about it now, I'll think about it tomorrow when I can stand it. Scarlett is one of the great survivors in film and literature, and much of her strength comes from this ability to ignore pain, loss, hunger, disappointment, and so forth, and to do what needs to be done. By shifting into action mode, she distracts herself from what she can't bear to feel. That's a big part of her strength. It's also possible to rely too much on distraction as a way to cope with unbearable pain. In the rest of my talk, I'm going to describe several different clients I've worked with over the years, all of whom came to me with a prior diagnosis of ADHD, although they didn't come to me specifically for help with that issue. I don't treat people for specific orders, and I don't subscribe to the current disease model of mental health that dominates our profession. But in my work with these clients, we came to understand how unconscious pain and defenses against it played a role in their ADHD symptoms. I work exclusively by Skype, by the way. I began taking on distance, client, distance clients about five years ago after receiving several requests for online therapy from people who'd been reading my blog. When I conduct a session online, this is the chair where I sit, and this is pretty much what my clients see. Dana was one of those clients. She wanted to work with an online therapist because her job required her to travel for months at a time, and going to a therapist's office on a consistent basis was impossible. She was in her mid-twenties at the time we began working together, an attractive, intelligent young woman who, for most of her life, had struggled with procrastination and an inability to follow through on school and work-related tasks. Dana had been conceived when her mother had an extramarital affair with a man who was HIV positive. Dana herself was born HIV positive and has been on antivirals her entire life. As a result of that affair, her parents divorced during her first year of life and her father remarried not long after. From an early age, Dana recalls feeling like there was something wrong with her. One of her earliest memories is of her stepmother <clears throat> excuse me, wearing surgical gloves when bandaging a cut. Her stepmother kept her at arm's length, literally and figuratively. Her biological mother fell into a deep depression following the divorce and subsequently led a chaotic, financially unstable life. For Dana, physical affection and the experience of bringing joy to her parents were largely absent from her life. Now, in my writing, I talk a lot about core shame, or an experience of feeling damaged, ugly, defective, inferior. It takes root in the earliest months and years of life and results from failures of attachment where joy is largely absent. It's usually, but not always, an unconscious experience, and as we defend against the awareness of it in various ways. Dana warded off feelings of profound shame by running away from or distracting herself from it, and by developing a sort of false anti-shame self that was intended to disprove her feelings of shame. This new and improved Dana tended to be a bit grandiose, with a drive toward achievement in more areas than was humanly possible. 
music, athletic, academics, she tried to excel in too many areas and mastered none of them. Whenever she felt frustrated, she'd shift away from whatever activity she was engaged in and move on to another. Whenever she encountered a shame experience by not performing as well as she expected, often because she hadn't managed to practice or study enough, she would usually abandon the endeavor altogether, take up a different instrument, pursue a different sport. As she grew older and began dating, she had many short-term relationships that fell apart because she couldn't find a way to tell her partners about her HIV status, a source of great shame to her, though she intellectually understood that it wasn't her fault. In her mid-twenties, when she finally did become more honest, she was met with consistent and humiliating rejection from men terrified that she would infect them. Her work together focused on helping Dana learn to face and bear with her shame rather than running away or distracting herself from it. Oh, and, and on this topic, when shame and distractibility is an issue, you'll often have to deal with missed or forgotten sessions and the additional shame they stir up. Dana often forgot her sessions, would later send me my fee and then disappear from treatment for a month or two. After she had recovered from the shame of forgetting, she'd get back in touch. I finally decided to send Dana reminders about our sessions on the day before. I'd write a short email along the lines of, just confirming tomorrow's session at 8 a.m. Eastern, for a long time, she needed my help in remembering. And, and now I don't send reminders to most clients, but I wanted to help Dana avoid situations that would stir up even more shame. This combination of core shame and defensive grandiosity has come up with another client I've worked with for several years now. Mark is an entrepreneur, one of the most creative business people I've ever known, and very successful despite his distractibility and difficulty staying focused. I've been in session with Mark when he will be discussing something in his business and he'll suddenly have several extremely creative ideas about ways he might expand one after the other and he'll eventually wind up losing focus. Like Dana, Mark tries to do too many things at once and works for too many hours every day in part because he's not able to focus and be more efficient. Mark originally came to me because during long drives between home and his remote clients, he found himself breaking down and sobbing for no reason he could understand. Mark most definitely lives in his head. Helping him to move down into his body and pay attention to his pain has been a lengthy process. Whenever difficult emotion enters the field, he tends to jump away from it. Over the course of our work together, we've uncovered unconscious shame with roots in his early childhood. A mother who he describes as ruthless and a father so addicted to pain pills that he pulled his own teeth out to get physicians to renew his prescriptions. Alan, an online securities trader, came to me because he'd become paralyzed following some large trading losses and could no longer function in his job. Completing his financial analysis and deciding upon a trade came easily to him, but when it was time to execute, he couldn't pull the trigger, as he put it. He wound up distracting himself with online games or household chores, anything to avoid having to follow through on a decision. As a child, he'd had many behavior problems at school, largely because of poor impulse control. In our work together, and this is a story that doesn't end well, sorry. Alan revealed that he'd always felt like a loser. When core shame is an issue, the language of winners and losers often comes up, and this is a major focus of my second book. On some level, being a loser means being ugly, defective, damaged, or inferior. I was able to help Alan recognize that his recent trading losses had stirred up his dread of being a loser and that he'd do anything else rather than risk further exposure to shame. After five or six sessions, we decided to try a real-time experiment. This is one of those ways that online therapy allows you to try different approaches from what's possible when a client comes exclusively to your office. So we decided that during our next session, I would be present while he attempted to execute a trade. 
he agreed to do his research in advance and come prepared to follow a stock's fluctuation ready to pull the trigger when his models told him the time was right. At our next session time, he didn't show up online and he failed to respond to my subsequent emails. I never heard from him again. What I learned from this experience is that successfully facing shame within a therapy session takes a strong bond between a therapist and client. Although I can't be sure, I believe that the prospect of me present to witness him failing stirred up unbearable dread. Since then, I have tried this experiment with another client, one I've worked with for several years now. Nigel and I have developed a strong bond of respect and affection over the years. And, by the way, one thing I've noticed during my career is that my most successful work is with clients who, for whatever reason, I find endearing. And it's not just the Yavis clients who strike me that way. The most powerful connection I ever felt and the most meaningful work I've done during my career was with a young woman who displayed powerful symptoms of borderline personality disorder. Anyway, from our first session, I found M Nigel very endearing, despite a somewhat pugnacious personality that had gotten him into trouble over the years. He'd seen several therapists already during his 20s and received many different diagnoses, major depression, bipolar disorder, ADHD, and most recently, narcissistic personality disorder. In his mid-30s, he came to me in part because he preferred to have sessions online, but also because what I'd written about core shame and narcissism had struck a chord with him. So Nigel came from a high-functioning family with two PhD parents, but his childhood was characterized by pervasive anxiety. He described his parents as remote, argumentative, and preoccupied in an obsessive way with their own worries, to such a degree that he constantly felt flooded and overwhelmed by them. He dreaded bringing friends home because his parents' nonstop bickering seemed so dysfunctional. From an early age, he recalls feeling weird, like an outsider, and not liked by the other kids. At the same time, he'd done extremely well academically, up through high school. I think largely because he was so brilliant that everything came easily to him. He had a cocky, overly confident air about him, which eventually got him into trouble. After earning his MBA from a prestigious business school, he'd worked in-house for two investment banks and lost both jobs because of a rebellious attitude, because of procrastination and inability to follow through, and eventually for being unable to get out of bed in time for work. Nigel's superior and aggressive personality, a defense against core shame, didn't help. When we First began working together, Nigel was in the process of starting an online business. The challenges involved confronted him with many opportunities to experience shame, all of them revolving around rejection and interpersonal relationships. If he needed to reach out to an angel for funding, he'd dread the prospect of being turned down so powerfully that he wouldn't send the emails or make the necessary calls. If he needed to hire someone new for his team, he'd repeatedly reschedule interviews because he was afraid he wouldn't come across as confident to the potential new recruit and they wouldn't want to work for him. During his work day, he'd constantly shift between one task and another, never completing any of them, working on one sentence or one paragraph for hours. Or he'd disappear down the Wikipedia rabbit hole, as he called it, when research on one topic led him to another and another and another ad infinitum. Oversleeping and missing his early morning sessions was an issue for Nigel as it had been for Dana. Sleep was the ultimate defense against prospective shame and severely impeded his progress in his business and in therapy. I settled on the same email reminder strategy with Nigel. It was less effective because he'd still sleep through his session on occasion, although he didn't disappear from treatment. Nigel eventually abandoned his startup and began applying for jobs. The same issues of distraction, procrastination, and excessive sleeping cropped up. When he began having trouble completing job applications, I suggested the same experiment I'd wanted to try with Alan. 
we agreed that in our next session I'd be present while he reviewed and submitted an application online. I believe my presence helped him to focus, and it turned out to be not so terribly anxiety-producing that he couldn't complete it. On this occasion, and throughout my recent work with Alan, I've expressed my joy in seeing him succeed. I find this to be crucial in helping clients to heal from shame. A joyful, securely attached parent is what he did not experience. A joyful, fully engaged therapist is only second best, but it's what I have to offer. My joy is sincerely felt, I should say, and I believe that simulating such feelings would be ineffective. I believe in Nigel, if I can put it that way. I'm sincerely happy and proud of him when he succeeds. We've tried this approach on several occasions, some more successful than others, but I believe he's getting stronger, more shame resilient, and less frightened, less frightened by the prospect of future encounters with shame. At the same time, the ADHD-like symptoms, distractibility, impulsiveness, procrastination, have waned in intensity. He's better able to focus and complete tasks in less time. He's growing more confident in his own abilities and becoming a less pugnacious and more empathic person. Working with these clients has led me to believe that defensive shifts of attention away from core shame early in life eventually become a generalized habit of mind. It seems that the entire attention apparatus has been undermined and weakened so that even when shame isn't necessarily a great risk, distraction has become a habit of mind. Anyway, I hope this talk will inspire you to think more psychodynamically about ADHD and to begin wondering about the possible role of shame in the symptoms displayed by your clients. I have a strong anti-medication bias, although I believe cognitive behavioral strategies can be extremely helpful. And I've come to believe that a fully engaged, joyful therapist is the most helpful intervention when defenses against shame are paramount. And now I can stop looking at the camera. Anyway, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Bye.